Good afternoon. I'm D-Day. And I'm Rex. And this is the Accuracy Third Podcast. We are an oral history of Black Rock City. We attend Burning Man, and we share something unique there. The things we do and see in Black Rock City, the bizarre and beautiful interactions that you have with brilliant strangers from around the world, the relationships we form with them for an evening, a week, or a lifetime if you're lucky. The art, monumental or mobile, visual, tactile, or auditory. All these experiences combine to create a fantastic adventure that despite its tremendous impact on so many of our lives, we seem to have a hard time explaining it to others. So we've started the Accuracy Third podcast as a repository for the stories of our community. Here we can share stories about our city and the lives that comprise it. We want to preserve and disseminate these stories because ultimately, we feel that Burning Man is significant. From its organic, unplanned emergence from the bohemian subculture of San Francisco to its decision to organize itself around the Ten Principles and really become a, a radical experiment in community. Burning Man is an unprecedented expression of American culture. It's fostered new art movements. It's hosted some of the most spectacular large-scale art the world has ever seen. Since its inception, it's spread from this obscure little art party in the desert to this global network of cultural events celebrating human expression. Look, Burning Man isn't as important as clean drinking water. But Burning Man is important in a cultural and an artistic sense. And it's really hard to describe. Just look at the trouble we're having explaining it to you and you know what it is. But we at Accuracy Third feel that we need to democratize the narrative So we're going to need your help to tell your stories, because at its root, Black Rock City is nothing but a few tens of thousands of really attractive, filthy people camping together. Communities are held together by stories, and Accuracy Third is here to share your story, and thus the story of Burning Man, which is really pretentious, so I'm not going to say that. (laughs) Communities have always been held together by stories. So Accuracy Third is here to share yours. In this introductory episode, we're going to share some of the stories we've collected from some of our friends and acquaintances around the Bay Area and around California. Going forward, as we get to meet more of you, we're going to attempt to structure our episodes around themes. Or we won't. As with most Burning Man projects, what we end up with isn't exactly going to be what we planned. And this podcast is a rough idea more than a plan. So the shape it ends up taking will depend largely on the participation of the community. So come on, tell us that you want to tell us your story at AccuracyThird.com. And remember, experience first, communicate second, and Accuracy Third. D-Day, what's one thing that's the same about the man every year, uh, and yet different. Made out of wood, but maybe made out of different pieces of wood? Sure, yeah, I guess it would have to be different pieces of wood. It's okay, Um, I know why you're asking me leading questions. Um, (laughs) You're talking about the neon on the man, because we have the uh, neon artist and installer Smoke Daddy here with us today. Yeah, that's right. Uh, So you are uh, friends with Smoke Daddy. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about him? I think of it as Smoke Daddy being friends with me. Um, You're right. That is kind of a blessing, isn't it? It it, it is. Um, Smoke Daddy is this amazing tall drink of water who kind of uh, moves through the world as if he's dangling from marionette strings. And uh, he does that because he is one of the most relaxed, peaceful, kind guys I know. He, he is. He is one of the chillest individuals I've ever come across. And he looks like uh, a neo-futurist uh, pirate. Yeah, like a, like a zen swashbuckler. It's, it's, a, it's a smart look. Uh, in the background, you will hear the voice of our friend Andale. And uh, here we go. Well, if you want, I guess I could always tell you the story of how I got my job. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, the illustrious Smoke Daddy. Um... Neon uh, installer and designer of Man Neon since nineteen uh, XX. Oh no, no! Actually, I've only been running the crew since like two thousand and one. But I was I was on it a couple years prior. No, I got my job because um, I was actually sober enough to keep standing. Um, 
I guess I should start back uh, before that, a week or two. My wife and I were in the middle of a disagreement, and we drank a lot. Um, I was a prop maker in Los Angeles, and I would work for a couple weeks, and I'd have a couple weeks off. And I liked the job because it supported the fact that I could be a raging alcoholic, and no one would mind because everyone I worked with was a drunk. And oh yeah, the the the, the prop shops I, I used to work in. Like the only time we ever went on strike was because we um, were working in a shop which will remain unnamed. There was a a, a a soda machine that only had silver bullets in it, and a lot of us couldn't drink Coors. It was just horrible. So we it's went on horrible. strike. Never. Yeah. We went on strike so there'd be Miller and uh, Budweiser in the machine as well. Thank God. Yeah, yeah. So it was a short strike, but we were mm -hmm. successful, you know, long-lived dictatorship of the proletariat. Yeah. So my wife and I were in an argument, and the house that we lived in had objects to art almost everywhere and weapons, you know, sculptures and knives and firearms almost everywhere. It's amazing we didn't injure each other more. No, she picked up a, a Green River knife off a table and took a piece out of my leg. Fortunately, the EMS lived next door. So. Is this a three-inch blade? Is this a six-inch blade? No, no. It was. It's actually it's a butcher knife. Well, the 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 Green River knives come from the the, the Green River um, foundry in where is it? New Hampshire. It's the oldest knife foundry in the country. They um, they take uh, barrel barrel bands because it's actually surprisingly good steel, and um, turn those into knives. And they, they've been, uh, those knives have been along uh, in America as long as there's been America. They went with Lewis and Clark out to the Pacific Ocean. You know, they've always been there anyway. They're beautiful looking knives, and I just happened to have one on the table that was next to her when she stood up and went after me with a knife. Uh, <laughs> oh boy, I like women with passion. Anyway, um, to, long story short, yeah, after I stitched myself up, or got myself stitched up, it's more badass if you stitch yourself up. No, no, I didn't do it. My neighbor did. He was an EMS, uh, an emergency medical technician. And, um, yeah, he came in quite handy uh, Yeah, when we lived next to him. Uh, I missed that woman. Um, I decided it might be best to leave town for a week or two, let her <laughs> calm down, because she did have a point <laughs> in her argument, even though I disagreed with how she did it. And so I got my buddy Primo, who needed to leave town as well. He had far too many moving violations. And we figured we'd go to Nevada, because Nevada's a really nice place. And what we used to do is we used to get big buckets of dirt from outside of, uh, you know, mine shafts, and then sit in hot springs all night and pan it out. And we'd never get enough to keep us going for very long, but enough to, like, you know, forestall having to go back to civilization for a week or two, and it gave us something to do at night. So um, we were actually up not far from where, you know, the, the Black Rock Lake was, and we went into Winnemucca, went into a bar. I started a conversation with an old man who I later realized was my spirit guide. I've met him two or three times over the years. <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy. Anyway, um, he started telling me about this Burning Man thing, and he, you know, just happened to have a couple tickets. What did I have to trade for it? And I, I wasn't all that interested, and all I really had was a half a bottle of uh, Pepe Lopez tequila. And, um, yeah, low rent tequila. Anyway, he said, fine, I'll take it. And he put the tickets down on the table, and I went out to the, uh, to the truck to get the tequila. I came back. The old man was gone. I asked my buddy, you know, Primo, where was the old man went? He said, I went to the head. We closed the bar. He never came back, and I had two tickets to Burning Man. And we had the time, so we might as well go. And we showed up, like, I think it was, like, Monday and the man was not up at the time. The man was like, you know, laying on his back. This was back when he was on hay bales. And what, like 20 foot man, 30 foot man? No, no, he was the 40 foot guy. This was probably 98. Uh, yeah, they parked us in Volkswagen camp, which was really cool. Those guys are out of sight. And the first thing we did was went out to see the man. And we're looking at him. He's laying on his back. And all of a sudden, this pickup truck, blue pickup truck with a, with a silver, you know, cap, kind of lurches up to the man and stops. 
the door opens and out comes a whole shower of MGD bottles. It was fantastic, you know, just to see how many could actually fall out of a car that was being driven. And the person who was driving it was so drunk, he didn't even give the pretense of standing up. He just kind of slid out of the door like he was on, you know, casters or something. And he actually got some distance from the car, you know, because the, the bottles were kind of like, you know, just rolling him down the playa. And he looks up and he says, my name is Neon Dan. I'm supposed to put Neon on the man, but I'm too drunk to move. Can someone please do it for me? And that's when Primo, like, grabbed my arm, stuck it into the air, and since we could still actually move, we started doing the job. It took us a day or two, but we got the neon on the man, and we've been actually doing it ever since. Had you known about uh, installing neon prior to that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'd done a couple jobs, yeah. I, um, I don't believe in synchronicity. Well, it's a duocracy. That's yeah. the whole concept of, the, of what Burning Man was. It has you largely see still is. I mean, you know, as big and bureaucratic as it is, it's all volunteer. Um, sort of. Sort of. I, sort of. Mostly. It, it skates the line between volunteer and exploitation. <laughs> um, and, and I think it would be dishonest not to, uh, labor, not to admit that. Labor of love? Yes. Yeah. Well, one change that I see in the last several years has the corporative structure, has taken place on the playa more and more is that is dusty adventure to another day at the office that a lot more of the bureaucratic structures are being you know required when it used to be you know we go out to the desert and throw a bunch of shit in the air and hopefully it stayed there that kind of structure can't survive this kind of growth i understand that mm -hmm. It's it's just something to see what was a religion turn into a corporation. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, I think you have a good dichotomy with your two guests today. My Burning Man resume consists of a I'm gate and perimeter dilettante, help put together a nice little homey theme camp somewhere deep on the three o'clock side, and I'm blocked by Burning Man on Twitter for being mean to Grover Norquist. Uh, I had I had cause to spend a lot of time. Uh, as you mentioned earlier at the at the airport this year and uh you know it was um there, there's a lot of great things about the airport burning sky is is awesome uh the people who put together the airport are terrific uh the scenic flights are a wonderful thing that the pilots do for people um, that anyone can take advantage of that's right you know the the increasingly the function of of, of the airport is arrivals mm. and um you know the folks coming off of these planes are not not uniformly but often they are the nightmare bloomberg business article about burning man and how it's becoming a uh, bilderberg slash davos kind of uh, you know power elite rave i saw people coming off planes with 40 paper shopping bags and no way to carry them and asking how they can call an art uber uh, to get them <laughs> to their camp three or four miles away. Um, oh, that hurt! That, that like that hurts the spirit. Like whatever's in the cockles. Um, I, uh, I just, had a, I had a, I had a European stranger ask me to take his cigarette butt to where? Uh, away from him. He was done with it. And, um, <laughs> here, let me teach you something. Pick a pocket. Put put the butt. Yeah, in the. Now you got a trash pocket. And, and I have to say, I'm, I, I think Europeans are uniformly surprised at the lack of places to put your cigarette butts. Uh, sure. I have picked up a hell of a lot of cigarette butts out of the playa, and a surprising number of them are galwas. I've seen... <laughs> wow. I don't even know how to spell that. <laughs> I had like a kind of like San Diego surfer looking kind of guy like ask me for the Wi-Fi password <laughs> oh, <that's great. laughs> at the airport. <laughs> Have you ever been to the Hershey's Chocolate Factory in Hershey, Pennsylvania? Have there is a wonderful, it's a small world style ride there called the World of Chocolate. And when you get to Hershey's, um, you enter through like the gift shop and uh, candy store. And a portion of that is this ride that takes you through a simulated like jungle through factory to packing plant of how they make Hershey's chocolate. Wow. Uh, and there's a wonderful jingle. It's one of the most wonderful jingles that anyone has ever written. 
Hershey's chocolate, it's a Hershey's chocolate, it's a Hershey's chocolate world. Um, and at the end of it, they give you a piece of chocolate. And we need something like that on 530 between the airport and the city. And yep. enculturation station? I, I used to be really upset with the plug and play people. I used to think that they're, you know, like destroying my festival. But I've come to accept that um, it's just part of the process. You know, let's just see where this goes. If you're not familiar with the concept of plug and play camps, here's a little primer on this plague infecting the soul of our city. Even though Black Rock City is built on a foundation of non commodification, there will always be some greedy assholes looking to cash in. These nasty buggers sell curated Burning Man experience to wealthy folks, offering them luxury amenities, gourmet meals, and exclusive on playa parties. They cordon off whole blocks of the city with giant, ugly motorhomes, creating big, unfriendly chunks of the city where suddenly the party stops. These creeps hire so-called Sherpas, paid servants who take up the tickets and don't actually participate in the event. No one likes vibe-killing capitalist cum stains, and we like these vibe-killing capitalist cum stains even less. It is everyone's civic duty to shame and harass plug-and-play camps. Find a blank block of RVs? Barge right into their common area and have a seat. See if they have any beer for you. Ignore the famous people and treat their Sherpas like honest-to-goodness human beings. Make them call a ranger to negotiate your exit. At least everyone involved will be having an authentic Burning Man experience. If we wanted to start Burning Man again, that's fine. We'll get a shotgun, you know, a bunch of shotgun shells, a couple dogs and some beer, and we'll go out to the desert where no one knows where we are and blow things up. With the rich and entitled, on one hand, I tend to answer them with love. But on the other hand, I do see them as an endless supply of like people to play really mean practical jokes oh, on. Oh, they're yeah. marks. Because, yeah, Such they've never seen marks. it. So, you know, all the beautiful ones. Um, I have a car. I have a staff pass. And I can drive around all week. And I do. The problem about going out to the airport is you do get commandeered. Mm -hmm. You know, I regularly get commandeered. And whatever they give me, it doesn't matter because I'll take them as far away from where they want to go as I can arrange <laughs> and convince them this is exactly where they want to go and get all their stuff out really quick and then disappear in a cloud of dust. You know, give them a burning man experience. That is loving. Yeah, that yeah. is actually a very loving way to solve the problem. Uh -huh. That's far more loving than sending people to the DPW ghetto, uh, which is my go-to. The thing is... Members of DPW, even though they come off as standoffish, there literally is no Black Rock City without them and the investment of three to five weeks beforehand and weeks afterward as they restore the playa to a state where we and the Federal Bureau of Land Management say we have left no trace of our city on the Black Rock Desert. So remember, friends, DPW loves us. They work hard so we can play hard. So when you run into them into the city, show them some love, too. Give them a hug. Offer them some water. And remember, fuck your day is just their way of saying I love you. I don't, I don't really feel like I'm instigating them by sending them green, silly Me, burners yeah, nice. to harass. Yeah, they, no, I mean, no, they I'm, live for that. Folks from across the country and from Europe who have to get out to the playa for the first time and have never been in Black Rock City before, they're not thinking about that trip in any other way than a commerce-based vacation because those are all the vacations they've been on before. They haven't been out there yet. It's not difficult for someone either willingly or unwillingly to take advantage of them or just take $5,000 from them or 9000 or 20000 for this vacation, which is a one-of-a-kind ridiculous thing that they are certainly not prepared for. You know, often it doesn't kill you. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that and it's it, not as dangerous as everyone pretends it, it is. <laughs> it's still pretty dangerous. It's dangerous in very different ways than your everyday city. Well, yeah, it's, it, but it is. it has all the dangers of your average you know, city with 80,000 people. It, it's got some of the similar ones. you yeah, got to watch out for traffic real bad. And somebody might get yeah. you to invest in a really bad startup idea. And <laughs> there's, just, there's a lot of peril. My folks told me that uh, they used the same excuse for the deaths that happened at like hippie concerts in the 60s, like Woodstock. And all of them were just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like, you know, a, a, a town of like 120,000 people, like they'll have a death. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it's, oh, yeah, it's not wrong. You can't squeeze a huge number of people together without squishing someone. 
And man, oh, especially like, if you like oil the whole machinery with as much liquor as you can put <laughs> in it. Well, I have scars from Burning Man. It is a dangerous place. That's a uh, a topic we're getting little bits on. What's your best Burning Man injury? Oh boy. Okay, physically, I got sliced up pretty good years ago when I was on a three wheel power bike. And it had no headlights, so I was holding an oil lamp in front of me. Like a lantern? Yeah, like an yeah. Lifted it from the lamp lighters. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, <laughs> in the days a before, lot more sense. In the days before LEDs, yeah, the lamp lighters actually had a function in this world. You know, it's like, oh, they're beautiful people, they, they, and I are am they, glad they exist. They're an important part of our community. <laughs> oh, me. they're vital. They are vital. I hold this We still time. got pennies. <laughs> we were talking about that earlier. This is a country that can't get rid of pennies. You know, those kerosene lanterns look really pretty up on the. Oh yeah, yeah. And there was a time hour, when hour actually, you know, when it, they were practical forms of light. Mm-hmm. And I had it on this three wheel bike. I had motorcycle, and um, there was this black tent line that I couldn't see because it was black, and I only have one eye. Clothesline myself, clean on it. I opened up my lips, something fierce. And yeah, no, I saw stars. That could have very easily have been kind of a fatal accident. Yeah. You know, absolutely. If it were a couple of inches lower and got you. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I got a big slash in my face out of that. I have still never fallen off my bike at Burning Man. It's a pretty soft landing. No, it's not. There's a lot of stuff (laughs) around, and bikes are heavy. I had a good face plant from about four feet, five feet up. And, you know, I mean, I heard a crunch, but my nose didn't seem to actually break. Um, but, I mean, that was nothing compared to the, the psychic injury I had from witnessing um, the... Oh, well, why, uh, why don't you hold off for a... Yeah, I think our just engineers... just a second are... while uh, the dogs bark. Um, I am going to stop this recording and save this file. Love you, Beth. The first thing I have to do is fix my own damn voice so I can listen to it. <laughs> Mm. Oh, I love the fancy spear you have. And I saved everything that we did uh, in the first. Wonderful. Um, it is like fifty-three minutes. You're welcome. Oh, There's boy. some stuff we need you to cut out, Beth. What? Some shit it talking wasn't that needs perfect. to be cut out. I was just going to take that whole thing. No, no, no. There are some it. things that should not have been said. Were, were we giving out device. Seth Beckman's uh, <laughs> social again? <laughs> Those are things we absolutely should be saying. <laughs> Things were said about certain volunteers in certain people's departments that ought not to have been recorded. Well, you guys are going to have to stop talking so much shit. You're making my job harder. (laughs) Oh, my God. Uh, You guys, I have to listen to every time your jokes fail over and over again. You don't just (laughs) cut that shit away? No, I know. But sometimes there's something funny. Like, sometimes it starts funny and ends funny, and you just shit the bed in the middle. (laughs) So oh, you can often actually that's what cut, with cut that part out and have something that's funny. Yeah, I have an absolute recommendation here. Tribe.com, as far as social media goes. <laughs> does yeah. that still exist? Yeah, it does. That, I was on Tribe temporarily. I think I posted naked pictures of myself on Tribe. <laughs> well, most of us have I might at one still time be or on another. Tribe. Yeah. But yeah, the Burning Man Tribe, I, it's not dead yet. It's, uh, you know, you can shoot a, 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 a cannon through the place and not hit anybody. <laughs> but it's still there. So Tribe will let you do it. No, also, Tribe will let tribe you die. post naked pictures of yourself, which Facebook will not. So that It's not the Tribe well, at once was. <laughs> Wait, they don't let you put up your naked pictures anymore? They used um, to have a setting where you could, yes, I'm going to put these naked in, like, naked for Burning Man. Topless people, but you could put them in a special area where only people that you were friends with on Tribe could that's, see. That's the jerk-off corner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I know that corner. <laughs> I don't think much of social media, but I don't want to see this particular format to die. Do your best. Go on, go on Burning Man Tribe today <laughs> and say something obscene. Okay, here's a challenge for you. A Burning Man story that does not have any conceivable drug references. One, two, three, go. What follows is literally 45 minutes of telling stories about peeing on the playa. So I'm um, cutting almost all of that. Uh, I'm leaving you with, I wouldn't go as far to say the best, but um, the least incriminating, maybe, of those stories. Um, And you're welcome. Oh, Marine a duct tape, uh, a tarp, and a funnel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right? I, they make rubber sheets in all standard sizes. 
I try really hard to suppress my feline side, but sometimes I will soak someone's bed in piss for ambiguous reasons. <laughs> Oh, here's a great Burning Man story that is also a piss story. I was in one of the trough potties uh, where where the fellows enjoy themselves. One of the jerk off trough no, parties, no, or the, oh, no, wait, oh, wait, potty. So, so the trough potties. In, in the, enlighten, enlighten for, female for, listeners for the, here. For the ladies who don't know, on one end of the porta potty banks, the opposite end from the big comfortable handicap access potty, there's a trough potty where there's a big long trough along each side, and eight or nine fellas can squeeze in there. And it all is piss tan at the same as time. fuck. It, More if they really like each other. And it's right? the best place to empty your uh, gallons of uh, piss water instead of bringing them to the Center Camp Cafe when you leave Burning Man. <laughs> it's true. It's super convenient. Don't be shy, ladies. Come right in. As this gal did, I was standing there taking a piss, and that door flew open. And th- this woman charged in, looked around, said, oh, my God, has this been here the whole time? Kicked one foot up shoulder height against the wall and just pissed right in the trough. Majestic. What, she, she was so stoked. She wouldn't have to wait in line ever again. No, man, that's oh, no. intolerable. Bathrooms are so few and far between when you need them the most, when you're drinking so much water just to stay alive, and so much more water to dilute the booze so that when you wake up dehydrated the next morning, like, you're also not at a critical level of, like, (laughs) needing water or your blood turning into crystals. Burning Man gets better after everyone leaves. Because what you're doing is you're you're bringing the the city back to a, a natural state. I mean, the the problem that I see with Burning Man is that when it's going on, it's not the Black Rock Desert. It's a city of 80,000 people with the same kind of rules, the same kind of structures, and a limited distance you can travel in any given direction. You know, you spend a couple hours picking up um, little little pink triangles off the ground from the you know the top of those single lube things because ah I was wondering what uh, what that was going to end up being from yeah sure those uh, foil wrap things yeah to be yeah. fair it's a hard moment to sort your trash properly well you yeah. know <laughs> talk to the ground crew when they go by orgy dome and they'll have a completely different opinion of the situation I assure you but once the gates come down once the fence comes back down and the desert comes back. And you can go in any direction you like for quite an unlimited amount of time if you put your mind to it. Then you start seeing the desert again. The sad part about stories with Burning Man is that they usually start off sounding like hyperbole. And then you wander off into left field and then you'll notice that sooner or later... You know, the the audience, the people you're telling the story to, their eyes kind of glass over. So, yeah, usually, you know, it's best to tone down the stories or just simply not tell them at all. <laughs> what well, I'll usually say when, when pressed for a story is that if you go to Burning Man, you'll do something or see something you'll giggle about on your deathbed. Accuracy Third is engineered primarily by Drunk Bath and ancillarily poorly by D-Day. Our theme music was composed by Jim and Damien. Accuracy Third is produced by Accuracy Third, which is Drunk Bath, D-Day, and Rex. And thank you for visiting Accuracy Third. is synonymous with the word chocolate. Today, Hershey produces many other famous brands of products as well. Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, York Peppermint Patties, Mounds in Almond Joy, Twizzlers, Beta, Whoppers, and Milk Duds are among the famous brands that have become part of the growing family of chocolate and candy products produced and distributed by Hershey.
you go, please give us your best Hershey smile. And we'd like to add your photo to the Chocolate World Family Hour. If you'd like a copy to take home, they're available for purchase as you exit.